Okay. Please be back. And get seated, please. Today was a last presentation, another remote presentation by uh, Andreas Fleischmann in Munich University in Germany. And he will talk about the insect associated with the Rosella. Uh, Andreas, please start. Yeah. So, good evening, and let's start with my talk about insects associated with Drosera. I will have Japanese uh, subtitles, which Koji kindly provided. So, carnivorous plants developed uh, a great variety of trap types and trapping strategies, um, like the Venus flytrap, you know. And generally, carnivorous plants are considered badly traps for insects like this sundew, which has captured large butterflies. Very few people know that there are also insects and animals living on carnivorous plants. Um, animals or insects living on carnivorous plants have been especially well documented in the tropical pitcher plants of the genus Nepenthes. Their entire food webs exist of insects, larvae, ants, which feed on the captured prey, and then there we have predators feeding on the in-fauna, even top predators, so we have complex food webs. Andreas, uh, could you give me just a, a few seconds? Yeah. This session was not done by the Japanese people, so please take care of the people who are using the Japanese people. If you can't read the Japanese people, please take care of the people who are using the Japanese people. Q&A is the Japanese people who are using the Japanese people. Thank you. Also, in the American pitcher plants, the family Cyrus and Jason, so Saracenia, Heliumphora, and Darlingtonia, the in fauna has been comparatively well studied. So, if you have large fields of Saracenia like this, people study with the insects living there, the birds of prey affection, and you frequently find, for example, um, the Pitcher plant moth of the genus Exira, and the larvae of this Exira moths, they live inside the Saracenia pitchers and feed there as herbivores. So the larvae, the moth deposits its egg inside the pitchers, and the larvae, they, they build a web so that they do not fall in as prey into the pitcher, and then they consume the interior, uh, the inner pitcher uh, wall, so they are herbivores on these pitchers. And then they pupate inside the pitches, and the moth uh, then uh, escapes from these pitches again. Also, if you open pitcher plants of Dalitonia, Saracenia, or Meliumphora um, in their native habitat, if you open these pitchers, um, you will find associated mutualistic mites, the genus Cyrasiniopus. They live inside all of these pitchers, they're everywhere. And, um, um, here you can see some of these small microscopic mites. They live there as commensals, so they're not harmful to the pitcher, and they're found everywhere. So this inflora has been well studied of the pitcher plant. However, the infauna and the insect associated with sticky carnivorous plants, they have comparatively poorly studied. Um, and there are even publications we say about Drosera, which say that no animals live on the prey, uh, on the leaves of Drosera, and no animals are associated with Drosera. Um, but this is not true, as I will show you in this talk. The genus Drosera, the sundews, they uh, comprise about 260 species, and as you can see in this map, they are globally distributed um, with the main centers of diversity in the southern hemisphere. Here you can see. The more red an area in this map is, the more species we find in the global distribution centers of Drosera are the southwest corner of Western Australia, tropical Northern Australia, the Cape area of Africa, and the central Brazilian highlands with more than 20, each area with more than 20 species, uh, the southwest of Australia with more than 100 species. As you all know, Drosera sundews, they have sticky leaves with the tentacles and disgusting mucilage and these tentacles 
this mucilage, they capture a lot of insects, so they're usually considered deadly uh, insect traps. The leaves and tentacles of about 80% of all Drusilla species are motile, so they're able to, uh, to form some motion to wrap around prey, so the tentacles bend around prey, and the leaves fold around prey. This is done to increase the contact surface with the prey for prey digestion, so they have more uh, leaf surface, leaf area uh, touching the prey, but also to minimize the loss of nutrients by rain, but also most likely by kleptoparasites. Um, large Drosera species like this Drosera finlaysoniana from tropical northern Australia, they can capture quite large insect prey, both in numbers, but also in prey size. So like these numerous butterflies, which you can see here on this Drosera finlaysoniana. But mainly Drosera prey is comparatively small, so rather small insects like these uh, grips, which you see here, Thysanoptera. Um, and here you can see again, also in the Drosera indica complex in section Arachnopus, which you heard about in the previous talk by Jan. Um, here the leaves are of you know, all species, they fold around the prey once it is captured. Drosera Prey attraction seems to be mainly optical, so by the glistening mucilage and the colors, it's currently studied by my team, and we also studied the insects associated with uh, Drosera. We can see Drosera vinifolia in the bog in Europe and Germany. However, a large number of Drosera prey is stolen by kleptoparasites, and the most frequent prey, uh, kleptoparasites of Drosera prey is in all habitats and in all continents are ants of various families. A scientific study has shown that up to 70% of all prey captured by drosera leaves get stolen again by ants. So this kleptoparasitism really has some ecological, Im some biological impact on, on the drosera. Um, here you can see the European bog ant, Formica fitzia, uh, stealing a captured mosquito from the leaf of Drosera rotundifolia. Workers of this ant species, they are strong enough, uh, they, they actively crawl on the Drosera leaves to search for prey, and the workers of this large uh, ant genus, they are strong enough to pull off the prey from the Drosera leaves again. So they really steal the captured insects. In smaller ant species, like this Myrmica species, um, several ant, uh, ant workers join forces and they dissect the prey and really uh, pull the, the entire pieces from the drosera until nothing is left. Okay. In this video from Brazil, you can see a drosera tomentosa with a captured fly. Actually, I picked that fly, put it on the leaf, and uh, watched just what's ha what happens. And here you can see the ants of the genus Pydole, a worker, and with the large head, this is a soldier, now it does not know what to do. So you see the worker actively crawls on the leaf and tries to pull off the fly. The small worker is not strong enough, but now the soldier, the bigger soldier, is help, helping him. And together with joint forces, they were able to remove this fly from the drosera leaf entirely. You see the drosera already had started to bend its tentacles on the prey. And there you can see the ants running away with the st stolen goods, and nothing is left for the trust. Now let's come to a different group of kleptoparasites. Here you can see the beautiful Drosera ordensis from tropical northern Australia. If you have a closer look at its leaves, you can see this capsid bug, this merida or capsid bug, um, sitting in the, on the sticky lamina and on the sticky leaf and waiting for captured prey to feed on. And these sandy bugs of the genus Cetoporis, they occur exclusively in Australia, and very little still is known about them. There are a lot of photographs, but the uh, taxonomy is still poorly resolved. Three species have been described, one on Vivis, two on Drosra from Western Australia, but more than a dozen species are awaiting scientific description. So there are many more species, but still undescribed. As I said, they live on Drosera or on Biblis, and the adult buds are perfectly camouflaged on the leaves by their cryptic coloration. So they mimic 
the, the, the coloration of the leaf of the tentacles and the, the mucilage, and you can hardly spot them. You can see them when they crawl on the leaves, not on the, the lamina part. And the, the juveniles, the larvae, they usually a bit better to spot because they, in most species they're rather greenish. Cetochorus uh, bugs are found across Australia, as you can see in this map from Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, they're found everywhere where there are lots of sundew species. But especially common there in the tropical north of Australia, on, uh, and they're very frequent on members of Drosera section Arachnopus, so the spider like sundew, here shown Drosera variatiorum. Quite often, several species from Drosera section Arachnopus are growing together. Here you can see in red Drosera aranthiaca and in green Drosera cuculata. But usually, they harbor the same bug species, so they're not that species specific, but sometimes with a the, with the different preferences of the bugs. So certain species of Cetochorus seem to prefer certain uh, sundew species. And these bugs can easily walk on the sticky leaves. And uh, they try to avoid the sticky tentacles, but if they touch them, they can also remove part of the mucilage from their body so they can clean themselves. And they are only very rarely found trapped as prey of Prosra as our prey study spectra by uh, especially PhD student Tilo Kruger showed. So we rarely find um, um, Cetochorus as prey. These, these sundew bugs, they feed on the captured Drosera prey, so they insert their proboscis um, into the prey and suck up the, the, the nutrients they need from the Drosera prey. So they really collect the parasites, they take some of the, the food from the Drosera. Of course, they defecate also on the leaf, and so the plant may retain some of the nutrients, but this still is an undergoing study. And you probably might know this system from a much more well-studied system uh, from the genus Ruridula from South Africa, which has very, very closely related myriad bugs of the genus Pameridea. Um, there are two species of Ruridula and two species of associated Pameridea bugs in South Africa. So this is not Drosera here, it's just show for comparison. And there's Pameridea ruridulae, which uh, lives on Ruridula gorgonias and also on Ruridula dentata. And this paler colored, slightly larger species, this is Pameridea malofi, um, which exclusively lives on Ruridula dentata. It's only found in Rivera and Tata, more in them. Um, these two bugs, by the way, do not occur together. And in Rivera, entire food webs exist, not as large and complex as in the Pentheus, but also comprising several parts. For example, there are uh, jumping spiders and lynx spiders, which hunt not only for the prey of the Rivera, but which also feed on the bugs. And we discovered the same on Drosera section Arachnopus in Northern Australia. There's a lynx spider, I don't know the species, probably of the genus Poetitia, which also hunts for the Cetochorus bugs. This also has been not documented so far. In southwest Australia, sandy bugs are very common in the center of diversity of the genus Drosera, especially on tuberous Drosera, so shown here. Um, uh, Drosera rupicula. And in this Drosera rupicula, um, you can find uh, numerous of these sundew bugs of the genus Cetochorus. Here you can see even five adult individuals on this farm. Could show. Here is one, it's easy to spot. There is another one. Here is one underneath the leaf. There is another one. And this one is doing its usual business. They feed on the captured prey, as you can see here. It's inserting its proboscis into the fly, sucking out some of the nutrients. And there have been some discussion that they might remove um, an excessive amount of nutrients prey that is too large for the sundew and would otherwise leave the leaf would rot that they take some of these nutrients and deposit it elsewhere. But also on the small pygmy drosera, where you wouldn't think that anything is living on them, you can find um, the sundew bugs. Here in Drosera scorpioides, for example, can you see the small bug here? Usually you can see them when you approach the plant because then they're moving. 
And these bugs, they are, as I said, they're perfectly camouflaged, so they usually have the same coloration as the Drosra has. And um, you can see them, they're quickly moving if someone is approaching. If there's even only a slightly shadow of a photographer, they usually hide in the center of the palm or on the back of the leaves. Um, you can see several species. This is probably an undescribed red species on Drosra stolonifera. And this bug, I'm really amazed how perfectly they're camouflaged. If you look at the wing color pattern of this sundew bug, it perfectly mimics the, the coloration of the Drosra. So here you have the bug, and it even mimics the, the, the tentacles, and the coloration of this bug ends here, where it's sitting in the center of the lamina, so the, the hind part is greenish, so it really even mimics the marginal and the central tentacles. This is an amazing coloration. Um, the juveniles of most Cetoporus bugs are easier to spot because uh, of all species I have studied, they are green, so you can easily see it here, it's feeding on this fly. There's a different species of Cetopora on the climbing species, Drosra sopertella. In the upright tuberous Drosra Cetoporus are usually sitting in the middle of the lamina, so in the middle of the leaf, or hiding on the back of Leave. Just in case you did not spot here, it is sitting. Usually you discover them on your photographs once you're at home. They're very difficult to find in the field because they're quite small. And here you can see uh, another beautiful undescribed Cetocorus species on Drosra verrucata. Uh, El Lori, late El Lori was calling this one the one with the uh, Aboriginal light. And when they walk on the leaves, here you can see a beautiful photo taken by uh, Thomas Carroll, who kindly allowed me to use this in my talk. You can see that they're not touching the sticky part of the tentacles, but they usually try to walk on the, the stalks. But as I said, they can also remove part of the mucilage once they touch it. Now let's go to Brazil from Australia, where we discovered, or more likely, uh, more exactly, Fernando Rivadavia in the 1990s already discovered uh, some some larvae living on sundew leaves, and we studied this then in the in the 2000s, where we discovered there are an interesting new uh, arthropod plant interaction with uh, Drosra. On the large Drosra species of Drosra section Brasiliana, like here Drosra spiralis in Minas Gerais in Brazil, we found fly larvae which live on the sundew leaf. You can see a Drosra spiralis again um, in uh, Minas Gerais, um, Brazil. And if you have a closer look on the leaves, you can see some captured prey, like uh, large insects sticking to these leaves. And if you look closer, underneath this crane fly, in between the tentacles, you see a fly larva here. I'm inserting it for you. And these are not captured prey. These fly larvae, they can walk on the leaves freely um, and on the sticky leaves. They do not attach to the tentacles and they do not even cause any tentacle reaction, any bending when they walk on it. You can see by the smear of these threads where this larva was moving on the leaf and they can freely move in between the tentacles. They do not stick to these tentacles. Um, here you can see Drosra magnifica, the largest sundew species of the America, which was discovered on Facebook and where we, by chance, also were able to study this interaction. This sundew species grows only on a single mountain peak in Brazil, and there these larvae are frequently common. On this Drosra magnifica, you can even spot two fly larvae on the leaves, here indicated by these arrows, so they're sitting on these plants. And they feed on the captured Drosra prey. Here on the right, feeding on a spider captured by Drosra magnifica, the large leaves. And on the left, it is has entirely consumed. So here's the tip, here's the, the head of the larvae. And where the tentacles are bending around, they're not bending around the larvae, um, but it was feeding the prey, which was already fully enwrapped by the tentacles. And here you can see a uh, larva of the, this uh, fly, 
moving on uh, the leaves of Trust Fragrão Mogolense in Minas Gerais, Brazil. You can see it was rainy on this day, but the, the leaves were still sticky. But the larvae, it's searching for food. Now it found a water droplet, which is not interesting to the larva. And it's crawling freely on the leaves. It's not stuck. It can freely move. You can see how it moves on the leaf. We published these videos when we described this interaction, so I'll stop the video here. You can see the larva feeding on the captured mosquitoes. So it's with its head, or they have no head with it, its, uh, its upper part, they do not have a head capsule, and um, they, they, with their mouth parts, they, they open the, the captured prey and they feed out from the prey. They're not sucking it out like the capsid bugs do, but they really feed on it. Here you can see the mouth part. This video again is online with a paper we published on this fly. So we wanted to know what it is, and Fernando Rivadavia and Paolo Conella collected some of these larvae and pupae, and with DNA barcoding, we were able to identify it in 2016 already as uh, Toxomerus basalis. This is a hoverfly, a Brazilian hoverfly. Um, this hoverfly was already described 120 years ago from Brazil, but nothing was known about its biology. How, where the larvae live and how the larvae live. And we identified now its biology. And by the way, these are the first photographs of living Toxomerus basalis adult flies. They were only known from museum specimens. So. And then in 2016 and 2022, we published two papers, one on the larva biology, and then in 2020, so last year, uh, on the entire biology. So if you want to read something about this sundew hoverflies about Toxomerus basalis, you can read in these two publications. Um, even the adult flies are not in the larvae, not only the larvae are living as on Drosera, but also the adult flies are associated strongly with Drosera. This male of Toxomerus basalis was sitting underneath a leaf of Drosera uh, graumogolens while it was raining. So uh, I was taking photographs of Drosra, and there was a small, a short rain shower, and the fly flew underneath the leaf of this Drosra to wait there until the rain was over, and then it was removing, uh, then it was moving again when the rain was over. So they're sitting underneath, not they avoid the sticky part of the leaves, so they can really recognize the traps and show some avoidance strategy, which was documented for hoverflies also in Japan, why they that they only approach the flowers, but not captured by the bees. And the females of this hoverfly actively search for Drosra to deposit the eggs directly on the Drosra leaves. Here you can see a female of Drosra toxomerus uh, basalis depositing its eggs or ovipositing on a leaf of Drosra lactifo. And in this video, which was taken by Paolo Bonella on, the, on Drosra magnifica, can see the fly which hovers around the leaves. Now it's sitting on the non-sticky juvenile leaf and now it's ovipositing. So it's searching for a spot to deposit its egg. It's still searching with the abdomen and now you can see the egg coming out from the abdomen. So you can see a whitish structure. So now it lays its egg directly under the drosser. There's the egg. Not so good in, to see in the video, so I took a close up here. You can see the egg on the back side of Drosra Magn Magnifica. From this egg, the larvae then um, um, hatch and they feed on the prey. And interestingly, we, uh, we also observed that um, adult Oxomerus flies even visit the flowers of Drosra, here at Drosra latifolia, and they feed on the pollen. Of course, they feed also on other flowers. They need nectar. Those flowers do not have nectar, so they also visit, visit other flowers nearby. So they are not carnivorous, the hive flies or the flower flies. They feed on pollen and nectar. On this map, you can see where Toxomerus basalis has been found so far in Brazil. White triangles are the historic distribution. So far, it was only known from Sao Paulo, from Pipe, which was where the no exact locality was given and from a few collections in Santa Catarina State. And the black triangles where, where Fernando, Paolo, and I observed larvae of this species, and the gray triangles 
they are where we observed both larvae and also studied adult flies. This was mainly in 2018 by Paolo Gonella and myself. And as you can also see, we greatly enlarged the um, area known, as you can see, we greatly enlarged the known area of distribution of this fly. So they were not known from Minas Gerais, for example. Here you can see um, a distribution in the same map, the distribution of Drosera section brasiliana, so these are the large uh, Brazilian sundew species, and the more red, the more species. And so it's not surprising that we found them in Minas Gerais because there's the center of diversity of Drosera in Brazil. And you can see the ranges, the distribution ranges of this fly and the Drosera, they perfectly match. So everywhere where there's a lot of Drosera species, we also find this fly. Except this, these two records, historic museum records from Santa Catarina, which were really curious, because there's no Drosera of the section Brasiliana growing there, but not even any other Drosera. Um, so the closest Drosera location to this spot where the flies were are 200 kilometers. So either the flies and the adult flies were flying a large distance, which we don't think, but rather that this is because the, 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 um, these uh, records were made from museum specimens, and these two were originally described as a different species of Foxomerus, these adult flies, but later synonymized with Foxomerus basalis. And so we think it might be a cryptic species which has a different larval biology, not living on grass. So this was Toxomerus basalis. We called it the sundew hoverfly. Um, and from the sundew hoverfly, I will show you now the last uh, insect associated with Drosera I'm talking about. And this is the sundew plume moth, the genus Bochleria, a pterophoric moth. Um, here, you, here you can see an adult female of the Eurasian species Bochleria paludum. And this moth species also occurs in Japan. Larvae of Buclaria exclu exclusively feed on Drosera species. And they have a very curious biology, with a, which was already shown by Fletcher in a publication uh, in 1908. And recently, there was also a publication about Buclaria in Japan. Unfortunately, not knowing this publication from 1908. Um, so the first instar larvae, here you can see it in the leaf of Rotundifolia in Europe, they feed on the tentacles of Drosera. So they eat the tentacles of Drosera, the entire tentacle, the stalk, its head, and also the mucilage. So they feed on the mucilage. They're not only licking it, they, they feed the mucilage and everything, all the, the tentacles. And now, but here you can see uh, larvae of Buclearia brasile in Brazil feeding on uh, Drosera graminifolia. And you can see where the larvae are on Drosera leaves, not only the, the, the caterpillar itself, which is again perfectly camouflaged, but where they feed, they leave behind traces of grass, so their, their deposits. And what's very curious about this larva is that when once they they grow, the second instar larva does not feed on the tentacles anymore. It becomes a carnivorous caterpillar. This is very rare in butterflies. It feeds on the captured um, insects. So this uh, so this um, caterpillar becomes from a herbivore on Drosera to a, a, in the second instar a kleptoparasite on Drosera. So and. Here you can see the, the, the larva feeding on a fly captured by a Drosera leaf. The last larval instar then feeds everything from the Drosera. So they're now really big, the third instar larva. Um, they feed on the leaves with the prey, with the tentacles, the entire leaf, uh, and also on the flower parts. And then it pupates, and pupate are formed on the back sides of the Drosera leaf, which are not dangerous to the moth, to the hatching moth, but also on the flower stalks. And this is an adult moth. So Buclaria, uh, 
there are six to seven species and the adults are very difficult to distinguish. They all look very similar. This looks like our Eurasian or the Japanese species, but this is Buclearia brasilia from Brazil. And by the way, this is the first photograph shown ever of this insect alive. There's only the only other photograph of Buclearia brasilia available so far are, um, is a museum specimen. So there are six to seven species of Buclearia. And if you look at the global distribution of Drosera, then we see that in all of the centers of Drosera diversity, there's also Buclearia. So we have this Eurasian species, then we have one species, Buclearia pavulus, in North America, two species in, uh, in South America, and two or probably three species in uh, um, Africa and Madagascar. But what about the Drosera Diversity Center in Australia? Most Drosera species globally are found in, in Australia. Um, there were no records of uh, Buclearia in Australia. But just by the presence of uh, Drosera there and being the diversity center, I predicted already in the year 2000 that, Drosera, uh, that Buclearia has to occur in Australia. And then I was traveling to northern Australia in 2014 in, in Drosera section Arachnopus. I was lucky to find these caterpillars, which I knew very well from Europe and other parts of the world. So we discovered um, Buclearia also in Australia. And in the year 2020, I could study together with Tilo Kruger the whole life cycle of Buclearia and its host, its host plants in Australia. You can see a female of this Buclearia species um, depositing its egg on Drosera uh, serpents in uh, northern, northern Australia. Here you can see the egg. Of the decision in Buclearia also has not been documented so far. And our findings and um, on the distribution and biology of Buclearia in Australia are going to be published soon. So um, at the end of my talk, I have to acknowledge a few people who helped and contributed to the study of uh, insects associated with Drosera worldwide. And I also have to thank Kochi Kondo for the Japanese translation. And I, with this, I will end. I have to thank you for your kind attention. And I'm open if there are any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah, so, should, I, should I stop the screen sharing? Um, no. Yeah, People yeah. So, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, at least. I think. So, you. Okay. Andreas. So, uh, yeah. Uh, one one question I have. Uh, so, other than the sticky viscosity. Um, and then I know that um, there's behavioral ways some get around them, and, and um, you know, at least saw one paper kind of exploring the biomechanics that come over that. But um, another question is uh, with the acidity of the, the dew drops. So we know, at least from one study with Nepenthes, that low pH uh, has a role in So I'm wondering uh, if anything's known or if you have any guesses as to how, um, I guess, especially the uh, hoverfly larva, which is in direct contact with some dudes up on the surface, how that isn't um, harming its skin cuticles. So um, uh, just if I understood you correctly, because it was very silent, the, the, the sound is very silent here for me. Oh. Um, so you were wondering um, about how the, the hoverfly larvae copes with the very low uh, pH and the acidity and, uh, of the sticky mucilage, right? Right. So um, maggots, fly maggots, they are very well adapted to living in uh, um, acidic conditions. Just think of Nepenthes pictures. 
and there are also maggots um, which live in the intestines of, of vertebrates, even in human intestines, there are case reports. Um, and if they can survive the human stomach, they can easily survive uh, sandium mucilage, which is not that acidic. And this fluid, for example, is more acidic. They do it while larvae can close their entire stigmata. They are protected by a relatively good cuticule. If you have fly larvae to study it, put them in alcohol. Um, fly larvae sometimes can to survive up to one hour or so in pure alcohol. So the alcohol doesn't easily penetrate. They can close all the openings. <laughs> For the consecutive interpretation. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I can give a summary of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I can this if you want. So, a um, fly larvae can cope very well with low uh, pH values and with oh. acidity. Andreas, can, you, can I just translate uh, for yeah. that, including question and Talia? There's a store, mm -hmm. isn't it? I will speak here. A mental with a case, the ga a doctor for a high of Kalai, Timoka, for those two days ago, got a woman, and said, What's your woman? What do you got in the night? A long one, you have a cigar, you have a smile, the chair, more, not even the door, and the customer, and the customer, and the customer, and the Mucilage is not a super glue. So, and the regular, for example, is much more better with the resin. So, this aqueous mucilage of Drosera is not very strong. It has not a very high retentive potential. There was, there was a study by Thomas Gibson in 1991 which already shows that if an insect is large enough, it can pull itself from the Drosera leaves again. So, there is differential escape. And we have a publication which will appear probably next month, which will show the escape possibility of insects from Drosera mucilage. So it's not a very strong mucilage. <laughs> Um, hello, Andreas. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, this is Amy from UMass Boston. Um, so about the room ritual as a symbol, 
you uh, you mentioned that there are two species of assassin bugs living, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Gorgonius. However, there's only one species in Dentata. And uh, so have you tried uh, moving the Dentata specific one onto Gorgonius and see what happens if they could survive? Or um, you know, if they couldn't, do you know the reason why? Or if you have a reason, maybe suspicion as to why? So uh, should we translate the question first, or yes. should I answer first? Yes, yes, I will translate. So, um, <clears throat> えっと私の質問はえっとあのドリチュラに、えー、住んでいるアサシンバグがえっとゴルゴニアスには二種類いて、であのベンタータには一種類しかいない。で私の質問はそのベンタータに特有なえアサシンバグをえっとゴルゴニアスに移したことありますか？でもしあるんだったら、そ,そのえっ、ー、とアサシンバグはえっ、ー、と生き残ることができますか。でもし生き残ること生き残ることができなければ、えー、どうしてだと思いますかっていう質問です。Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so, um, what happens with these bugs? We know very well from cultivation because at least in Europe, both have been in cultivation since quite a long time, 30 years or so. So both species can live on both Viridula species in cultivation. So it does not matter if you have one bug; you can put it on Gorgonias or on Viridula dentata. And why one is only found on one species and the other one on two is probably biogeography, because、uh, a Meridia Viridula lives more closer to the coast and maybe a little bit up to the the Cedarberg Mountains, and Viridula dentata, which is much wider, just a few. In the more inland population, we find only Viridula malophia. I know from cultivation that you cannot have both bugs on the same Viridula species because the smaller but faster growing black one, the Viridula pomerida viridula, which is more common in cultivation, it outcompetes apparently the larger but slower propagating、um, Pomeridia malophia. Okay, thank you very much. えなんですけれども、えっ、ー、と移したことはあって、であのどっちもあのどっちにどのアサシンバグもえっ、ー、と両方のえっ、ー、とドリジュラで生きられるっていうことなんですね。あのえっ、ー、とカルチベーションえっ、ー、と栽培えっ、ー、と栽培していく上ではえっ、ー、と両方生きることができるということで。あのどうして一つだけ、えー、デンタあたりは一つのアサシンバグしかいないかっていうのは多分あの地域的なことでちょっとどっちか忘れちゃったんですけど確かあのゴルゴニアスはあの海岸沿いで、えー、デンタあたはもっとあの陸内にいるということでそういう地域的なあの差じゃないかということでしたありがとうございます。Hi, this is Nishiya Sansei from NIBB Japan. So, thank you very much for the really, really beautiful talk. So, the, usually, many insects cover from parasitic insects, parasitic bees. So, how about the yes, bugs, parasitic to the ocera? Do they have such kind of parasitic bees? So,、um, I let translate this, sorry. <laughs> ah, so that. Okay, okay, I'm going to say this Japanese. Hello. 虫って大概あの寄生蜂っていうのがいてほとんどの虫ってその対応する蜂に寄生されちゃうんですねでものすごく寄生しているああいう虫にそういう寄生する蜂がいるのかなと思って聞いてみました OK please reply So this is a very interesting question and we are currently studying this So as you said many insects have parasites and Buclaria indeed has a parasite Apparently, in all Buclaria populations studied so far,、um, there is a, a parasitic wasp which parasites the Buclaria caterpillars, and then the wasp fades outside of the caterpillar, and、uh, so this regulates the the, the cleptoparasite population also. And interestingly,、uh, we we currently want to find out if the the parasites probably are found within 
the restaurant price spectrum or if they can also avoid um, while searching for the host, the drosra. So if the, so, so if the, so there should be, so there are, so the caterpillar and there are the parasitic beings, is it right? Sorry? So there are I parasitic ones also. There, there, yeah. uh, sorry, there are parasitic insects which live on the kleptoparasites mm -hmm. of Prostra. So, and the, the parasitic ones, the, the kleptoparasites, they are parasites. They are food parasites, stealing food from Drosra. So on Drosra, we have the insect association. We have prey, we have pollinators, we have herbivores, like Claria, which I have shown you, and we have kleptoparasites, like the, the Toxomerus larva or Cetochoris, which are kleptoparasites. And then, not in Drosra so far, we have also mutualists, which is a symbiosis for the benefit of both that's in Roridula, which is okay. We don't know still if Stochoris on Drosra is a kleptoparasite or a mutualist if they donate back some of the nutrients and if it's a profit for the, the sundew plant compared to regular digestion. So, if so, plastic to Drosera, uh, it's not uh, so some kind of adaptive significance to prevent the uh, plastic bees. I'm sorry, I did uh, not so understand the, the question. Okay, sorry. So the, uh, the parasitic bugs to Drosera have the advantage not uh, to be fake. Yeah, to uh, prevent uh, the so, parasitic bee. Uh, so you want to know what's the advantage of these parasitic bugs yes, on yes. Drosera? Yeah, well, they, they have prey, which is relatively immobilized, so which they can easily feed on. And of course, they're also protected on the sticky sand dew from other predators. This is very easy to see if you approach the, the plants, these bugs hide inside the center of the plant or underneath the leaves or in between the tentacles where they're protected. And this probably evolved several times because um, capsid bugs um, this is known that a lot of capsid bugs live on sticky plants, not only on, on carnivorous sticky plants, but also on other sticky plants where they feed on captured insects. There's a lot of publications about this, um, and there's a review by Wheeler and Criminal, I think in 2006, which shows how many plants, how many sticky plants there are on the planet and how many different insects are living on sticky plants, not carnivorous plants, but other sticky plants. So, 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 my question is, so, 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 sand you help not to be parasitic by the other insects. So, so, parasitic, so, parasitic bugs live on the sand you. So, mm -hmm. in that case, the parasitic bees may be prevented to get the insects. Ah, now I think uh, I got your question. You you yes, want yes. to ask if these these capsid bugs, the advantage for the plant is that they protect it from other parasites. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks. Ah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> now, <that's the> question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, this is interesting, and this is also what we study, and apparently they don't, because in northern Australia, on members of section Arachnopus, so on the spider leg sand use, we found both. Cetochoris, so the bugs, and also the Buclaria, the caterpillar, the herbivore, and they do not apparently feed on the herbivore. And also, um, sometimes there are aphids on Drosra. By the way, there's a special Drosra aphid, which is only feeding on Drosra, which was discovered from Drosra Anglica in Europe. And also, if you have Cetochoris bugs living on Drosra, they still can get aphids. So they're not interested in, in any other insects other than the captured prey, apparently. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, the, the Cetochoris bugs also pierce the plant. They suck up also the sap from the plant, like Pameridea does with Viridula. So they're not fully beneficial to the plant. And they do not protect the plant against other insects, at least not what is known from my observations. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting in nature. あの、
道ってみんな規制されて、えっと、いろんな蜂が規制したりしてるので、防水固形の葉っぱに規制してる蜂には、えっと、その規制するものはいるかっていう質問で、それでそれはいるんだそうで、それで、防水固形がレバレバするから、その規制されないように守ったりしてないのかなって聞いたら、そうではなくて、それをすり抜けて、規制するやつもいるんだそう、ためたりするやつもいるんだそうです。なかなか複雑です。More questions? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Mine's a quick question. Uh, for the insects that uh, live on the tuberous yosura that are dormant all throughout the summer, do you propose that, they, that the insects also go dormant through the dry season? That's, uh, so I let translate first. That's an excellent question, which I was wondering myself as well. And by the end of the growing season, you only have adult bugs. You don't have larvae anymore. And El Lori has found out that uh, at least in some of the tuberous rostra, you find hibernating um, uh, septoporous adults underneath or sitting around tuber or even underneath the paper sheets. So apparently they go dormant also with the drosera species. And I have to say that they don't exclusively live on drosera, but they are also found on other sticky plants. And in the tropical north, for example, you find them also on sticky stylidium species or on other sticky plants. So it might also be that they spend some time on other sticky plants. Whereas if we compare with Pameridea on Ridula, they are exclusively found on Ridula. They have not been found on any other plant so far. And also in the greenhouse, they do not go on to trust rock. Thank you. <laughs> はい、えーとですね、私もそれってどうなのかなと思ったことがあるとおっしゃってまして、えー、成長期の終わり虫が成長するシーズンですねその単の終わりにはやはり成虫の虫しかいなくても幼虫はいなくなってますよねで、えー、確かにそのセトポリス属の,の種類の虫はえっ、ー、とドロセラと一緒に吸入するっておっしゃってたと思うんですけどもただあその、一緒に寝ちゃう虫ばかりではなく、えー、ドロステラかその特定の種類の植物が吸入してしまった場合は、えっと、他の,あの粘着力のあるスティッキープラントというのを見つけて、そっちでお休みして、そっちで一緒に暮らしたりする虫もいる。ただ、えっと、食ド,ロドロセラならドロセラで植物を特定の植物にしかつかない虫っていうのがありまして、でそういう虫たちはあの他の新しいその、えっと、災害のホットプラントというのは見つけずに、えっとえっと、1つの種類にしかつかない虫は1つの種類にしかつかないという回答でしたね。<笑>はい。ステギリウム。ステギリウム。はい。<笑>はい。ありがとうございます。Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Atlas.、Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, here, here is Andrei Pavlovich from Czech Republic. Hi.、Um, hi, hi Andrew. Ah, you're very nice. <laughs> <laughs>、uh, thank you for a very nice talk. And、uh, I have one question. Uh, uh, do you know or did you try an experiment with the adult flies、uh, which have this tentacle avoiding behavior? If、uh, this behavior is kept also on、uh, other species of、uh, the sandhu plants or is only fixed to, to, to specific、uh, species? I, so I let translate first. <laughs> えー、避ける接種性があるっておっしゃったんですけども、他の植物で実験したことはありますかという質問です。So I would, so I would have loved to study this, 
but unfortunately it's very difficult to study this in the field uh, on Pico Padre Angelo in Brazil, that Rostra Magnifica grows. This is on 1,500 meters. It's a very rainy area. So to have all the equipment for video recording and showing this avoidance strategy is very complicated. Also, these other habitats which are very remote. And unfortunately, we, I, we don't, anyone who has these flies and the lava in cultivation, so that we could do this in cultivation, these observations were all made in the field. And it's very difficult to make an experimental setup there in the, in the tropical areas. I would love to study the avoidance behavior of these hoverflies, but I'm hoping for the colleagues in Japan who did some studies already with the avoidance behavior of another hoverfly, which is a pollinator of uh, Drosera serpents and Drosera indica, um, why they are not trapped and how they behave. Um, but generally, it's known from hoverflies that they very well recognize their, their areas and also by the coloration, um, recognize the overposition sites, for example. So I'm, I'm quite sure they recognize the cross by the color. Yes, the kite is very なんですけど、天天卓、あの専門ですね。専門先ほど修正っていう範囲に見られる専門卓の修正っていうんですけれども、非常に複雑で、え、上まで出て研究しなければならない山研究が中心になっていくんですけれども、その生産してる場所がブ
further question. I was already hearing the bell that my time is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, this session is supposed to finish uh, uh, half 12 five in Japanese time. And it's <coughs> already a few minutes over. So, and, uh, if you have, yeah, if, if the audience has further questions, they can also write me an email, and I'm happy to uh, um, answer their question by email then. Okay, thank you very much. and um, enjoy the time at the ICPS conference and hopefully see you in person next time. Bye-bye. So next time we'll be very close to Steve Homer. Yeah. But actually, uh, Deutsch German Maybe. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye.